Hello aspiring coders and a warm welcome to the Coding with Sean channel. Today we're going to be looking at what are programming and languages. So we're going to start with a very brief intro to computing, then explain the purpose of programming languages, and go through some programming concepts, including how programming works as a whole and how it works step by step. By the end of this lesson, you'll be very familiar with what programming is, what the purpose of all these different languages are, and how it all works, including all the different steps associated with programming, from you writing the code to the computer, fully understanding, compiling, and running it. So without further ado, if you're ready, let's begin. All right, so let's go ahead and take a look at what are considered to be the first computers. So the first one is going to just be a scale, super basic. It, the idea is just to compute the relative weight of two items. If you haven't used a scale before yourself, then surely you've seen someone else use it. It's the most basic form of computer you can have for the most part. And the idea, again, is just to see if the first item's weight that's put in the scale is less than, equal to, or greater than the second item's weight that's also put in that scale. And the second type of computer is going to be your abacus. And the idea with this is to perform mathematical computations. You can see a picture of the abacus in your lower right corner. Now the abacus was primarily thought of as Chinese, but there also exists Japanese, Mayan, Russian, and even Roman versions. Now of course it can do your basic addition, subtraction, and other similar super basic mathematical operations, but in addition, it's also able to do square roots and cube roots. So again, these are just your two first computers, and they're just, you can probably notice they are really basic, and they're not what you'd think of at first when you think of computer, but it's important to understand this because this is really gonna be your most primitive type of computer and it's gonna be what forms the basis for the type of computer that you think of today. So I want to briefly talk about Stonehenge. If you don't already know, Stonehenge is an ancient monument located in Wiltshire, England. It consists of a circular arrangement of large standing stones that were erected around 2500 BC. Now the purpose of it is not definitively known, but it's strongly believed to have been used as a sort of supercomputer that was able to track the position of celestial bodies. Now again, the reason that I'm including this along with the abacus and the scale is that it doesn't meet our modern traditional view of what a computer is. There's no electricity flowing through here, there's no memory, none of that, but it still serves as a computer because you're using it to, as a tool to ultimately be able to accomplish those other goals, such as with the scale to measure the object and such as with the abacus to perform those mathematical calculations. This too here, the Stonehenge, is also being used to do those calculations to track the positions of the celestial bodies, and therefore, it is still considered to be a computer. So I want to briefly look into the significance of computer size with you. So to do this, I want to use ENIAC, which stands for Electronic Numerical in Integrator and Computer, and it was one of the first electronic general purpose computers. So it was developed around World War II, and it was used to calculate act artillery firing tables for the Army of the United States. ENIAC was designed and built by a man named John W. Mockley and Presper Eckert at the University of Pennsylvania, and it was completed in 1945. Now the reason I'm telling you all this is because it was a very large and complex machine consisting of more than 17,000 vacuum tubes, 70,000 resistors, and 10,000 capacitors. Even if you don't understand the meaning or significance of those terms, it's, it's suffice to say, it's a lot. And IAC was per capable of performing a wide range of calculations and was significantly faster than any other computer at its time. It paved the way for the development of modern computers and is considered to be a major milestone in the history of modern computing. Now again, Take a look at this and look at the size mainly. You have, all we're really doing is we're calculating some base, some mathematical calculations, such as for example, like I said, the artillery firing ranges. When you think about it, it's really just some simple basic calculations with the angle and the velocity of the projectile. But we're having such a large computer uh, with again, 17,000 vacuum tubes, 70,000 resistors and 10,000 capacitors. But Let's go ahead and look at ENIAC today. That's it. Now, of course, I can't show you the actual size through a video, but this is approximately a millimeter large. Again, this 
small chip is doing everything that that room full of one computer could do back then. So the reason I'm telling you all this is to tell you, with computers, small size does matter. It is extremely important for us to make sure that we're not using an excessive amount of space, that we're minimizing the amount of space needed to be able to do a specific thing. So in this case, we were able to take that entire room that was just that computer and make it smaller and smaller until today we're down to just that millimeter large microchip. So all that aside, let's look at why you would even want to study different programming languages. Well, the first thing is that you'd be a better software engineer. A software engineer needs to be able to do a variety of things. And being able to understand how to use different language features is definitely one of them. Furthermore, knowing many different programming languages, you'd be able to appreciate the implementation issues that would occur if you only knew one programming language. Knowing various ones, if a specific programming language doesn't work for a case, then you would be able to use a different one. The next thing is that you'd have a better background for language selection. If you know many different languages, you'll be able to more aptly figure out which one is the best for a specific scenario. If you're familiar with a range of languages, then you won't be limited to using one specific language for everything that you do, and it'll allow you to understand the issues and advantages and disadvantages for solving any specific issue with a specific programming language. Furthermore, Knowing multiple programming languages will actually make you better able to learn new languages in the future. You might need to know a lot to be able to reach to this point, but if you are, it'll help you tremendously as you go on and code more and more complex problems. So continuing off of that, you also have a better understanding of implementation issues, and you will answer questions such as, how is this feature implemented? So for example, if you want to add a specific feature to your program and you only know one programming language or two programming languages, you might not be able to appropriately implement that feature if the programming language in question does not have the capacity to do so. And so knowing all these different programming languages, at least a couple, will allow you to be able to be more suited to implementing different types of things in different scenarios. Along with that, you might be able to answer the question, why does this part run so slowly? In a, in a program in the real programming world, you'll rarely only use one programming language. You'll have multiple at play, usually about three or four, depending on the size of the project. Uh, but the idea is that different parts will be coded using different languages as appropriate for the scenario. So in that case, you'll be able to answer questions such as why does this part run so slowly? Because you'll be able to understand those different programming languages and understand the issues and constraints. Now, the last thing I want to say is that you'll be better able to design languages. Now, at first, this might seem a little weird to you if you are just starting to learn programming. But when, as you go further on, you might find yourself wanting to develop your own language. And if that desire does become truth for you, then you'll definitely much you'll be able to do it in a much better fashion if you already have experienced multiple different programming languages and you know how they're built and how they all work, and you can use that to make your own. Because again, those who ignore history are bound to repeat it. The reason that I'm putting this quote here is that ultimately, if you don't know those different programming languages and you make an oversight in when you design a language, if you design a language, it'll cause a real big issue because now you have to go back and you have to fundamentally change your language. That's the thing. If you want to avoid making these mistakes that have already been made, make sure you look at all these different programming languages and you compile them just the best parts of them and the parts that that allow you to ignore that allow you to make the language without adding all these different issues and you'll make a much better programming language again this is probably for the uh, future for you it's probably not something you'll be interested in doing right now but you'll see the value of all this as you continue on in your programming journey so let's look at ultimately why are there so many programming languages? The thing is, there are thousands of programming languages and just those are, and of course, there's even more ones that are lesser known or that are used by individuals. And ultimately, it all boils down to evolution. You have structured languages 
leading to something that we call object-oriented programming. And of course, these are a little bit more complex terms, but the idea is basically we're taking some languages that are just, you know, raw programming. We're just looking at everything from a sort of broad perspective, and we're boiling down to these newer programming languages that are some of these other programming languages that are really just you know, specific to each each and everything that you do, which are it's really known as object oriented. I mean, that's a bit of a simplified explanation, but that's the idea at its core. Furthermore, there are special purposes for some of these programming languages. So let's take, for example, these. We have, in some cases, we'll have using we'll be using a language called Lisp for symbols, Snowball for strings, C for systems, and Prolog for the interrelationships. So again, you can see we have four different languages here being used on potentially just one program, and each of these is serving a specific purpose for which it is good. Again, personal preference also is a factor in this because you just might like using one programming language over another and might just you just might be more suited to that. Programmers always just have their own personal tastes. Furthermore, expressive power is another thing that adds to the reason that there are so many programming languages. Some features in a specific programming language might allow you to express your ideas better. Again, moving on with that, we another reason that you might see is that they're really easy to use, especially for teaching and learning tasks. Now, of course, there are some programming languages that are harder than others, but in general, most are generally easy to learn, at least for the basics. Another thing is the ease of implementation. Again, it's easy to write a compiler or interpreter for a new programming language, as long as you just have a little bit of an idea of what you're trying to do. And good compilers are another factor. Just for example, Fortran in the 1950s and 60s, just a really good way to be able to, you know, create new compilers. And again, compilers are just your way of basically running your code. And these newer ones just they got more and more advanced, more and more capable. And so with more compilers and more and better compilers, we also saw more programming languages. And then lastly, we're going to also talk about economics and patronage. Example is COBOL and ADA. Now, just the thing is, the programming is, when you really look into it, programming is also a little bit about, you know, economics and, and of course, patronage and heritage. So the thing is, just with the demand in the economic market and with the, you know, the heritage of these different programming languages coming down, we just see them diversify into all these different ones. And that's also a significant factor along with everything else. All right, so now let's get into the different domains of programming. The first application is scientific, so potentially using the computer as just a large calculator. So for example, for, so for this specific purpose, you might see the language Fortran and its friends, maybe a little bit of ALGOL or APL. And using the computer for symbol manipulation is also another thing, especially when you are trying to make some of those more complicated scientific formulas. And Mathematica, just in general, is a big application that you'll see programming being used in. Next application is that of business. So data processing and business procedures, programming is just a really good way to make this efficient and fast. Um, some languages that you might see are COBOL, some PL slash 1, RPG, and some spreadsheets potentially as well. Next application is that of the systems programming. So you'll see just building operating, syst operating systems and utilities. So basically just the core things that run these computers are also themselves built upon uh, code. There's a lot, there's a more for this, including C, SPAL, Bliss, and some others. Parallel programming is also a, another use of programming. Now you may not know what this means, but the idea is basically that you're running code on multiple computers. So you have parallel and distributed systems. Again, don't worry about the, term, the terms if you don't understand them, but the idea again is just you're running code on more than one computer. Some languages that support this are Ada, CSP, Modula, DP, Menta, and Legion. Artificial intelligence is a major, major domain of programming, one that is seeing rapid growth in the market right now. Basically, the idea is to use symbolic rather than numer numeric computations, and it lists and it uses lists as a main data structure. And the idea is to just get more flexibility. We're looking at code in the form of data. 
So we have Lisp in 1959 and Prolog in the 1970s that really started this, uh, this you know, this trend heading into uh, artificial intelligence using programming. Another domain is scripting languages. So we have a list of commands that need to be executed. We might use Unix shell programming, awk, TCL, or Perl. Again, the idea is just to make a script, run it, boom. All right, another major programming domain is education. So there are languages that are designed to facilitate teaching, such as Pascal, Basic, and Logo. Again, these special purposes, purposes other than the above, uh, include simulation, uh, specialized equipment control, string processing, and visual languages. So those are the major programming domains. Now that we have that aside, let's go ahead and move on. So looking at some programming paradigms, in a minute I'm going to show you a little snippet of assembly language. Um, but we're going to be studying five language paradigms in general. So those are going to be top-down, functional, logic, object-oriented, and aspect-oriented. Now, of course, this is a bit specific for this particular video, but these are the major language paradigms that you'll see when you actually look into the more, some, some of the more niche details, some of the more specifics of programming and its paradigms. So as promised, let's go ahead and look at that uh, assembly language snippet. So if you don't know what assembly language is, it's one of the lower level languages. We'll talk about that in a second. But this is a program to add two numbers, as you can see. So the idea is literally just we are obtaining two numbers and we are adding them. Notice, even if you don't know assembly language or even if you've never seen code before, I think it's abundantly clear that for, a, for something as simple as just adding two numbers, this is pretty complex. And the reason is that assembly language is a lower level of code. So let's go ahead and take a look at those levels of code. So when we talk about a level of code, whether it's high level, mid level, low level, the idea is not how good or bad the programming language is or anything of that sort. The idea is just how abstract the programming language is. You know, how far away we're going from that base level binary code. Binary code is the only code that computers can actually understand. Any, uh, any code besides binary has to be sort of shifted down to binary in order for the computer to be able to process it. Now, the reason that we don't use binary code when we as programmers are programming is because it is wildly complex because it's only ones and zeros, right? So to be able to program even the most basic thing, you might have to use thousands, even hundreds of thousands, millions, billions of these ones and zeros, which is not really realistic when you come to think of it. So that's why we've kind of abstracted these programming languages that go up, that go higher and higher until we reach some of the more popular programming languages. You'll see at the top, at the high level scripting languages, you have Java, Python, Perl, and Shell. Even if you have no idea what programming is, you've probably heard of at least one or two of those. And those are the most high level programming languages. Those are like just what the absolute highest, most abstract type. So and when you write in high level, it has to go down through all these. It goes to mid level, then assembly, then machine, then binary. So the, the idea really here, so like we just looked in a, at an assembly language snippet. So you'll see assembly language here is about right in the middle. It's not a high level language or even a mid level language, but it still has some distance between binary and itself. So the idea is basically when you write assembly code, it's going to be more lengthy per se. Because the thing is, when you're writing in a level that is lower down on that abstraction skill, you're just going to end up having to write more because there's less abstraction and you have to be more specific with what you're doing. So let's look at a history of programming language. In the 1950s, we saw pseudocodes being released. There were many of different types of these. Now, pseudocodes are not real code. They, pseudo is a, a root that literally translates to fake. Pseudocodes are fake codes. And the idea was just introducing this concept of programming and using a computer to simulate to do different functions. Now, later in the 1950s, we saw IBM uh, come out with Fortran. Now, Fortran was the first, you know, really high-level, high abstract, and widely used uh, and really powerful programming language, per se. And then in the 1960s, we saw Lisp come out, and it was McCarthy who developed it. Then we saw Algol in 1958. That was a committee that led to Pascal and Ada as well. COBOL came out in the 1960s. It was Hopper that was the key player there. 
And then we saw functional programming, so FP, you know, Scheme, Haskell, Machine Learning. And then we saw logic programming come out after that with Prolog. And then object-oriented programming, so these are some of the languages you might have heard of uh, if you're not too well aware of the different languages, so C++, Python, Java, those types of things. And then we saw aspect-oriented programming, so Aspect J, Aspect C++. And this type of programming is still really in development a little bit, but it's still, there's, it's just hugely functional, just, you know, really able to do a lot of different things with that. A little bit not completely similar to, uh, not too dissimilar to object-oriented programming, or OOP. And you have parallel or non-deterministic programming. Again, this is just spreading it out over many different types of computers to be able to do things at a larger scale. So two words that are often confused are compilation and translation. So a translation is something that does a mechanical translation of the source code. So you're not really looking deep into the specific syntax or semantics of the code. Again, just a mechanical based translation of that code. Now, in comparison, you have compilation, which does a thorough understanding and translation of the code. So you're not just, you know, spitting it out. You're actually going through it and analyzing the different semantics and syntax inside of it. Now, a compiler or translator changes a program from one language to another. So, for example, a C compiler would change C into assembly, which is lower down on that abstractness scale that I showed you earlier. And then an assembler would then translate it into machine language, which is even lower, and that would eventually become binary. Now, a Java compiler might change Java code to Java bytecode, which is a little bit lower, and then the Java interpreter would then run the bytecode, which would be able to actually give you an output. Okay, so now that we've talked about what compilation is, let's look at the stages of it. So at first, you're going to have your scanner that just goes through that code and just make sure there's nothing terrible off the top. Then you have your parser that goes through the individual parts of that code and does this basically the same thing as the scanner, except we're now we're really looking more in depth. Then you have semantic analysis. Now you're looking at the semantics of the code and making sure there's nothing uh, wrong there and also going through it and feeding that over to the runner. And then you have your intermediate code generation. So this is going to be where you're going to be, now that we've already checked everything, we've already done all the analysis, we're taking our code and changing it to that lower level language. At this point, you could do machine independent code improvement, but that is of course optional. And then next, we're gonna go ahead and do target code generation. So we've done your immediate, your intermediate, whatever was in between uh, where you went, where you started at and where, what language you wanted to get to. So now, now we're going to actually get to that final language. Now here you can do machine specific code improvement. That too, again, is just going to be optional. So for many compilers, the result is going to end up being assembly language. Uh, and that, of course, would then have to be run uh, through an assembler. <clears throat> so these stages of compilation are machine independent so this is not going to uh, this is not going to utilize the machine as it does this part and they generate the intermediate code that's between those levels that you're looking for so that was a very broad overview now let's actually look at the specific steps so with a with the scanner step the first thing you're going to do is you're going to recognize the tokens of a program so some examples include these and the idea is just you're going to be uh, looking for specific, specific keywords that do specific actions. And then lexical and typographical errors are also detected here. Now, this specific step is actually so complex that it far exceeds the scope of this video. But I will make another video in the future uh, where I go into more detail about that. So then we look at the parser step. So here we're going to be putting the tokens that we obtained from the scanner and putting that into a pattern. So for example, you might have this. So this line would have 11 tokens, you count it out, you'll see. And it is the beginning of a method. And a method is basically a function. It's a, it's a small segment of code that performs a specific action. Any syntactic act, uh, errors that may have been put into that code are gonna be detected in this step as well. So for example, if the tokens are not in the correct order, we might have something like that. Again, you can you have two int here for no integer uh, keywords here for no reason. This specific line would have four tokens, int, int, foo, and that semicolon. Now, after the type integer, the parser is going to naturally expect uh, to get the variable name. So, for example, foo, but it doesn't receive that. So, that, that's not going to be counted as another type, and it'll throw an error. Now, looking at the semantic analysis, at this step, we're going to be looking for semantic correctness. 
So to understand what this really means, let's look at a semantic error. So we put foo equals five here, and then we we initialize a variable called foo. Now in C, and in, to be fair, in most programming languages, a variable has to be declared before it can be used. So when you think about the syntactical analysis, when you think about the syntactical correctness of this, th there was no problem with this in the parser step. But now we're looking for the, the semantics of this, the lines are going to be invalid and we're going to throw an error here. Again, the parser is looking for just syntactical issues. And in terms of that, there is no issue here. But because the variable needs to be declared before it can be used, this is invalid because we're declaring it after. So let's look at that uh, compilation step of intermediate code generation and improvement if needed. So pretty much every compiler is going to be generating intermediate code. And this allows for part of the compiler to be machine independent, no connection with that machine. And then you can optimize that code. So you might optimize it for speed, memory usage, or the footprint of the program. And that'll lead to your target code generation and improvement. So the intermediate code will be translated into the target code in the step. For most compilers, the target code, so your final code is going to be in assembly language. Uh, for Java, the target code is something called Java bytecode. This is an exception, uh, but it really serves the same purpose. So the code, if needed, can be further optimized here. Again, you'd optimize for speed, memory usage, or program footprint. So that concludes this video. Thank you very much for making it to this point. I hope this was very informative. We talked about uh, what pro why we have so many different programming languages, the history, a little bit about the history of computing, a little bit about the history of programming as a whole, and we went through all the steps of running a program. You now officially know everything that happens when a program is run. Thank you so much for making it to this point. If you have any specific questions about anything I cover in this video, please let me know in the comment section. And if you have any ideas or you really want to see anything come out from me in the future, please let me know in the comment section as well. Thank you very much for watching, and I hope to see you in another video.